Welcome to Selling in the Motor Trade in association with Automotive Management and Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice, tips, and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bokert, or some of you might already know me as Skippy. And firstly, I want to say thank you for taking the time to tune in. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Steve Curran. Now, Steve Curran, he runs Total Selling Solutions, and you'll hear from his accent, he comes from down under again. Now, I've met Steve at the National Automotive Dealers Association, and we're putting the world to right about sales process, what's happening in the industry, where we're going. I thought we've got to get Steve on the podcast. So, Steve, firstly, thanks for coming along. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So, Steve, um, let's find out uh, a little bit about how you started the motor trade. Um, when did you start the motor trade? What was your journey? Oh, my journey was I started in the workshop as a technician. Okay. A mechanic back in those days, I was the guy with the uh, the, the, the greasy overalls on, yeah, working on the cars. And then um, I, would, I was after a bit more coin once I progressed from an apprentice, and I knocked on the manager's door and I said, "Look, can." I get a pay rise. He said, you've got to do a bit more to get a bit more. Yeah. So I progressed into a service advisor's role. Then I, then okay. I moved on into sales. Ah, so service advisor to sales. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So, so one, one, of the, the, one this of the most challenging, job, hardest jobs I ever did was a service advisor. So, Oh, Steve, yeah. I'm glad you said that. Whenever we do any training, I, I promise you, the service advisor is the hardest job in the dealership bar none. Um, yep. it, it really is there. It, uh, I think it's probably good grounding, isn't it? Real good Definitely grounding. Good grounding because you start at seven thirty a.m. and you get um, uh, you have eight, eight or ten people lined up and they all hit you with all their challenges and they're a bit grumpy because they're going to work. Yeah, and it's the first way out of their way in the last twelve months because they only come to you every twelve months. Yeah, and you know, at the end of the day, they they've got to rush back to you to pick their car up. So it's not a great experience, and and plus they've got to hand over a handful of cash. So. Um, there's a bit of negotiating, you're on the phone, you're doing upsells and people want to negotiate. So, you know, although you might be doing a real crappy job at the moment that you don't love, it could be sort of, you know, sharpening your skills for a later career path. So why this jump into selling cars then? Was it more coin again? Oh, well, it took me by surprise. So um, my manager at, at that time, he gave me a, a position on the front counter as a service advisor because a senior service advisor actually went to the UK Okay. six weeks and they wanted someone to fill the counter so i did that and then when when he came back john reed was the guy's name when he came back they said you're pretty good on the phone and over here what we've got to do is to get um a vehicle work approved say for a fleet company you've got to ring these fleet leasing companies up and they're pretty tight with their spend yeah and you've got to sell to them why you want to do all this work right <laughs> everywhere <laughs> around the world they're still tight with around their the spend. world right yeah. so they're, they're, they've got all the same mould. So um, when John came back from his UK uh, trip and that, the service manager said to me, he said, we want you to be like a rep on the road for service. I okay. said, what, 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 does that, what does that mean? He said, well, go through all our old records. Anyone that hasn't been back in the last 12 months, any businesses, I want you to ring them, make an appointment, go out and try and get them back into the business. So, yeah, that was my journey into that. And so I did that for six months. And at that time, the dealership only had one franchise. It was Holden mm -hmm. back then. And then they were getting a second franchise, which was Mazda. And they had a manager, but they had no sales staff. So my service manager, who was a business partner in the dealership, he said, come and have a, have a meeting and have a chat. And he sat me down. He said, look, we've got a great opportunity for you. He said, uh, how do you feel about selling cars? I said, what? Be a car salesman? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. This is a true story. I went home and told my family, they've all gone, what? Be a car salesman? Because all they do is remember me in greasy overalls. Yeah. So, yeah. But when I transitioned onto the front counter, wearing nicer clothes, they probably could see a bit more opportunity. And so could my, the, the guy that I was working for at the time. So that's how I got into uh, selling cars and being a car salesman. Cool. Well, this always separates the real motor traders. Do you remember the first car you sold? Yeah, the first car I sold was a Mazda 6 estate wagon. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it got delivered, my manager called me into the office 
And he said, what have you done here? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's normally, normally only $2,500 gross in these cars. You've made four grand. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't know. I was, it was the prices in the book and I, that's what I charge. He goes, oh, he goes, oh, I know what you've done. They've bought a manual, but you're charging for an automatic. <laughs> so that was the first car I sold and it was highest gross. But I think we tell you after that, it sort of went, you know, I learned all about gross and then, you know, an over allowance and there yeah, my gross has dropped. It, it always amazed me so many times when people first, you get that brand new car salesperson. He yeah. doesn't realize that there's an overage car out on the forecourt, out on the lot. And he sells the yeah. overage one. He doesn't realize yeah. that, hold on, well, that's the full price. That's what you charge. And when we're in that's the business right. for a while, they start to, oh, overlands and giving it away. And where do we need to be? It's um, Def yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we, we get preconditioned. So, and we start believing everything that someone tells us that they've seen up the road or yes. gotten a price up the road. And then we're too quick to run that price into our manager and spend more time negotiating with our manager about the price and negotiating or, you know, doing the, the sales process with, with the, uh, the guests when they come in the dealership. Is it so true? I was in the Land Rover business um, uh, beginning of this week and yeah. a guy come in and it was a brilliant salesperson speaking to his sales manager. I just yeah. said, mate, are you working as hard on your customer as you're working on your sales manager? I mean, he was brilliant at working his sales manager. It was one of the best sales pitches I've ever seen. And he just yeah. had that little smirk on his face and that little grin there. Um, yeah. it, it, uh, it, it happens. When you were selling, do you remember any yes. really great days? Any great days where you thought, ah, I've made it as a salesperson now? To be honest with you, it took me 12 months to get comfortable with selling mm. cars. Okay. Uh, and I still tell trainees right now today, if there's any trainees listening, like I had butterflies in my stomach for the first 12 months. And I used to sort of, you know, panic a little bit because I thought, what if they ask me a question I don't know? Mm. And the best thing I ever did was learn a few techniques okay. um, on how to get my questions right, you know, which was, which armed me with a bit more knowledge and made me very much more comfortable and confident. So I suppose it wasn't one real defining moment but yeah it was just 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 learning yeah techniques to sort of be able to learn the right questions mm -hmm. and to, to open people up and i found once i opened people up i just started working them a lot better but i'll tell you one 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 quick funny one i i still remember to the day and like this is a, a lot of years ago when a sales my, one of my sales counterparts said to me he goes look you try you test drive everyone mm -hmm. i said yeah well that's what you got to do you know you got to test drive people and he goes, well, you know, why did you just test drive that guy? Like, you spent two hours and he's gone, you know? And I said to him, I said, well, at least he was a chance in selling a car to. I said, I'm talking to you now. And I've got no chance of selling your car, yes. right? So I talk to two or three people a day. You spend 30 minutes or an hour with each, every guest that comes in my dealership. But how hard is it? And what I learned was very quickly was the people I thought were dead set going to buy a car didn't really buy a car and the ones I thought was sort of a little bit fluffy, not a lot of buying signals, ended up buying cars. So I thought, how can I second guess the market? And another thing I did was sometimes I thought it'd be clever and I thought, oh, well, this guy's not going to buy a car. Look how fast he drove up the driveway, right? And he'd get out of his car and I'd say to my selling buddy, other buddy, I'd say, you, you want to talk to this customer? Because I want to go and grab something to eat and then, yeah, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have the next talk. I'd go in the back room, have my lunch come out, He's signing, and he'd be there signing, signing this per person up that I classified as like not a buyer. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and that was another thing. So yeah, there's not really one defining moment. It's just a whole series of different moments that sort of you know, gave yeah. me life lessons. It's so true. Tommy Gibb, a uh, friend of the show, uh, we interviewed a while back from the States. He said the yeah. trouble with the motor trade is every now and then a miracle comes along. And he said, uh, on that used car, a miracle comes along and you make full gross. And I think that's what happens with car salespeople. Every now and then they sell a car without doing a demonstration drive, okay? Mm -hmm. And they think, ah, oh, I can sell a car without doing that. Why don't I try that all yeah. the time? And they start yeah. shortcutting the system and getting yeah, a yeah. bit of knowledge there. And I, I think that's yeah. what happens to lots of us there. Yeah. It does, especially between COVID. I don't know what happened in the UK, but over here we're letting people just test drive the cars on their, on their own. Yep. Um, COVID's pretty much you know gone mm -hmm. uh, in, in in Australia, and guess what? Uh, salespeople are still using that as an excuse to, to yeah. you know what uh, to send people out on their own. And um, we know that you know, most of the rapport is built on the test drive. It's the only time 
we talk to people and we're not looking at them in the face. And um, most of the chat is that even about the car. It's about life and, mm-hmm. you know, where they've been on their holidays and all those rapport building conversations. So if if you're a salesperson out there and you're not test driving, you are dead set, um, you know, you, you, you're playing at a disadvantage. And the other thing is too, you might think you've been getting away with it, but your competitors are going to start yeah. test driving more. And if you're lagging behind, um, not yeah. test driving, let me tell you, your competitors are the smart salespeople have a smart dealerships, have a strong process to ensure that the salesperson is spending as ma- the maximum amount of time with the guests when they come in. And that includes like for test drive. Yeah. Uh, Steve, I, you hit the nail on the head for me. I, I, I got to say over the last three years in COVID times, yeah. we all know that the supply issue was a real it, it, it was an issue everywhere around the world. Yeah. So the sales process went out the window. There's so much low hanging fruit. And um, there's so many people that were selling vehicles without having to go through any process because the process was, is the car available? Yeah, I need it. I want it. And, and the sales process was, well, if you don't want it, I've got three other people who want it. But I've got to tell you what, and um, I think Australian market, you guys are ahead of supply mm-hmm. where we are in Europe. And what I mean by that is I'm hearing that more and more suppliers coming through all the time. Um, yeah. We've got to get yeah. back to the basics. We've got to get back to slowing the process down and sell yourself first, the product yeah. second, before we sell yeah. the deal. Yeah. Um, now's, the time to get, now's the time to get sales fit. Yeah. Yeah. You, don't wait, till it's, you don't wait till it's raining to fix a hole in the roof. So, Steve, this is a shameless plug for our first 90 day program. We often say that the people learn in the first three months the skills that last them for the rest of their selling life, okay, good and bad. Can I ask you, is there anything in your first three months that's as relevant today for someone who started either selling cars or maybe a service advisor as it was when you first started? Number one thing is get training, okay? If you don't have a lot of access to training, training, the biggest tip I can give everyone out there is spend more time and ask more open-ended questions, all right? You're going to gather a lot more information. So the example I like to give is when we're talking about trade-ins, don't just ask the guest, are you replacing a car with another car? Do you have a trade-in? People say, yeah, I do. Don't just say, look, well, okay, great. I'll get that priced up for you or I'll get a valuation. Dig deeper. Ask them questions about how long have you had it? How's the car been? Um, why are you thinking about changing it over? Has your lifestyle train, uh, changed? And that's going to go into like 10 different avenues where you can find out more about people and help build that, that trust. But I'm going to tell you here in Australia, we run a program, um, a sales cadet program, and um, it runs for six weeks. And what we find is that we fast track people from zero to hero with road to the sale and road to the phone appointment. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's all the technical stuff. Um, it's all the word tracks. It's, it's understanding the process. Reality is they're not going to turn into a superhero in three months. Mm-hmm. Okay. No one does. But the, the, what happens is it gives people great foundations on how to build their sales process. And what I found was for me, for the first more than three months, probably up to 12 months, I sort of knew what I was doing. I was selling cars. I didn't have to keep my job and earn a, a, a company car, plus earn reasonable commission. But I didn't really know how I was doing it all. <laughs> I didn't know. I, I was just sort of working people on it. And I like people. I like to talk to people. And I believe that got me through. But as I progressed further, I, the penny started to drop about the process. And that's why I do this in this position, because if I don't qualify properly, when I negotiate and I get uh, pushed back on the price, I get bounced on the price, I've got nowhere to go. So it was all about closing those escape hatches. And I'll never get one of my managers, my first manager, Ted Dickinson. He was a it was an ex truckie He was one of those guys, but it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a really great trainer. Was and he, he a, said to me, A manager, more of a mentor to you, was he? A bit of a mentor, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I said, I don't have that guy, Ted. I just couldn't close him. He goes, Son, you're a bit nowhere. I said, What do you mean? He goes, You're leaving all these gates open. And he was a country yeah. guy. And he said, Think of a barn. If you put all the horses in the barn, um, and you don't close all the barn doors. The next morning, there's no horses. And so that's like you're closing. You've got all these doors open. You need to qualify better, right? And, uh, and I learned from that, and that was like the typical question, you know, like, who else is going to be involved in the buying process? And people say, oh, it's just me. Well, that's obviously an objection you shouldn't get. 
at the end of the negotiation, uh, the sale. So true. So true. If it comes so, up, uh, then you've got your qualification wrong, haven't you? Yeah, you got your qualification wrong. So, so what I learned by by that by having training, we didn't have like training companies then. You know, mm. they'd fly a guy in from the states and he'd come for a week and then you know go back home and we'd forget everything that he said. Uh, you know, being a great trainer, we get really pumped up, but you can't remember everything and life happens. Yeah. And dealership life is just so chaotic and even more chaotic now for everyone. But having a process you can lean back on, mm. um, it mightn't sink straight in today, but it really helps. And the pennies start dropping, you go, yeah, that's what happened. That customer walked out. And I still remember, like, we had an elevator platform. And when people would leave the dealership, I'd go out there, I think, I just ran over my mind, what could I have done differently to get them to buy a car? Yeah. And I counted every car I sold up to the first 100. That's a true story. But I think, what you know, what, what could I have done? And, and um, I, can, I think, okay, I could have test driven that person a bit longer. Yeah, I should have got his partner to drive the car. Mm-hmm. Um, I should have engaged, engaged the, the, the wife a little bit more. You know, or I, I could have done my write up better instead of just having Bob on the write up. You know, just all those little things, and I've just been checked. So when the next guests come in, I've, I've plugged that hole. I love that. You are hungry. It's like, what can I do better? How, how do I improve myself every single time? That's um, it. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely love that. So listen, I'm always interested. How does someone like you and I go from selling cars to running our own training company? What was your journey then? Yeah, uh, my journey is probably it's probably typical, but it's a little bit um, interesting and lucky, I guess. Okay. okay. Um, and that's the thing: if you're always doing something good, someone's always noticing, even mm. though you think they're not. So with me, I was you know, selling and managing um, um, cars and a dealership uh, for 15 years. I was working for a company; it was one company, but it did progress into a bigger, 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 and they bought. It was back in the day all the companies are buying big companies they became a big group so i started um selling one uh, servicing one site selling in another site and then it became a manager and got into a general manager's role at a totally another de- uh, dealership an hour away which was part of the same group mm-hmm. so after 15 years my kids were getting a little bit older and, and and so on i thought i'd like to have some more time with them now 14 and 11 yeah. thereabouts um, and back then in the day, you had to work every weekend. Yeah. And that's what, it, it, it was a Sunday. Oh, sorry, it was a Wednesday to Sunday job. It mm-hmm. really was. Mm-hmm. And if you were at work at those days, you're going to be miss out, missing out on opportunities. So um, no doubt, diff, no different from a lot of the guys and girls out there today. But, um, yeah, I always was looking for that edge. You had to work those retail days. So what I ended up doing was I was looking for another opportunity, and I actually left the business momentarily and bought a tyres tyre franchise. Wow. Okay. You know, those guys that come in their their, their, their trucks and they got all, all the all the alloy wheels and nice yeah. tyres. I could be that guy. Okay. Right. Um. And I had a workshop background and so on. I thought if I buy one of those tyre stores, it was Jack's tyre stores. It's like a it's a franchise over here. Don't know if you got it in the UK. No. So I ran, I ran the franchise. All he said, come and have a meeting. He said, great. He said, you got good training, good background. We got a factory store. Why don't you buy that? So we did a deal on paper and it was a trial period of three months and I got in, left my role with the company I was with 15 years and uh, started running the store and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the model was really good. The people, the head office was fantastic, but I just could not get my head around selling tires and making 20 bucks here and 50 bucks there. Hmm. Uh, selling a wheel on for $75. And when you're making, when you're selling vehicles for 80 and 100 K, and you come down to small transactions like that. Um, there's just it's too many transactions. It was back to the service advisor's role, I think. Mm. And um, I rang the uh, the the owner of the whole of Australia up and I said, "Hey, Fred, I'm really sorry, but you know uh, this isn't for me." And he goes, "Bloody hell, we really like your style and so on. You know, we you know, you sure there's anything we can do and all that?" I said, "There's not. I'll, I'll give you a month, and then yeah, we'll go from there." And he was fantastic about it. Um, so I hung in there, and you wouldn't believe it. A week later, the phones rung at this at this uh, tire store, and it was a guy that owned a training company. Okay, and he said, "I'm looking for someone to look after our training business in Sydney, New South Wales. Uh, would you like to have a chat?" I said, "How'd you get my number?" And he said, "Well, another guy named Hans, who's an IT guy, 
uh, contractor, and he said he knows about you. He did some work for McGrath's. That's who I used to work for. And he said, you'd be a really good guy to talk to. Uh, and he said, you left, and he wasn't sure what you're up to. So no one knew I pulled the pin. Yeah. His friend. And the phone's run. Yeah. Right? Someone's so always watching. Like, Do a good job. Someone's watching. watching. Right? So, yeah, it's just um, that old thing, like dress for the job you want, not the job you've got. Um you know, because I always, oh, always I've never watch. heard that phrase. I love that. Dress for the job that you want, not the job you got. Is it yeah, so, so true? Yeah. Other sales guys used to buy the thirty dollars shirts. I'd buy the eighty dollars shirts. You know, okay. they buy the shitty ties with the cartoons on it, which I, I still don't understand why people wear that. Uh, yeah, if you yeah. wear that one out there, look, it's your thing. That's all cool. But, but I, I could never. So I, you know, business time and all that. Um, and this this guy's rung me up, and then I went and worked for him. He was awesome. His name was Mark, and he told me a lot of things I know about uh, now now about business. He was a fantastic marketer. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I worked for him for about, you know, six or seven years. And then I thought, okay, well, time to get my big boy pants on and do it myself. Yep. So that's that scary am. moment where you think, right, let's do it for myself then. Oh, shit. Yeah. 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 yeah you go do it. So tell me about your company there. What's a typical day look like for you? Yeah. Yeah. So we we service all of Australia. So um, we've got 150 dealerships across Australia. So it's all the way from up at you know in in far north Queensland all the way down to Western Australia, and I've got I've got a lot of help. We've got um, four trainers in different states, and then plus myself, and then we've got staff at head office, and then we've got thirty four call assessors full time who just listen to phone calls. So what we do is we record calls coming into dealerships, and then we assess those calls based on what the business owner wants the salespeople or service people to ask. And then we provide an assessment which populates a portal. Um, and then those scorecards go back out to call um, to the call takers. So we send out about 20,000 assessments per month all, all across. And we spoke about before, like about training and how do you make it stick and so on. So we actually go in once a month and train, but then we make sure the training stick, training sticks by sending call assessments back during the absence of our training. Because otherwise, they will forget what you do say, hmm. right? So there, there's little reminders. So we've got a lot of mechanisms in the background, and there's 44 people in our company that help all those mechanisms work. So my job each and every day is probably more so um, I work on the training side of the business. Um, I've got a son that works in the business. He's a general manager. His name's Jacob. He looks at every, he looks after everything at HQ and all our call assessors, which frees me up and allows me time to do the things like I'm doing right now but also go out and visit dealerships yeah. and do training and visit in dealerships. So whether I'm traveling in the state or um, I'm checking in with my staff on the phone um, or answering emails, dealers, dealers will ring me to have a good relationship um, or just contact me, me, me direct. Uh, sometimes I get a salesperson that I've met who'll contact me direct and I'll get back in contact with them. Uh, sometimes I'm doing deals. Uh, we do presentations and I've got to get out there and sell. And our product, just like yours, Simon, there's no one pushing you to sell it. You're going to push it. Um, it doesn't come out of a box. It doesn't come from, you know, the, the, the store that you can get in the road and buy it. We've got to manufacture it, just like you have to manufacture your product. So we're going to keep it fresh and going out and talking to people, keeping your ear to the ground. I think it keeps it fair income, keeps yeah. it real. Because mm. um, people know if you're, you know, if you're a bit, bit of a phony, right? And they yeah. know if you're not in much. So, yeah, getting at the dealerships is what I do like to do, but it's just balancing what I've got to do every day. So uh, I just keep, you know, the main thing, the main thing, you know, if we're not selling, if we're not closing deals, um, we're, not, we're, not, we're not building and growing our business. Um, if we're not shooting content um, and, and videos and, and training videos, doing podcasts, we're not growing our audience. And, you know, social currency is definitely the way to go. Um, that's how you beat the big dogs out there. Um, you know, no use throwing money at the market anymore. You've got to get your presence out, out there, yeah. right? Um, retention's another big thing. So I go Steve, in every four. Steve, what I love, sorry to cut you off there, but um, I, we just uh, met at the NADA conference and uh, I know yeah. we both go out there all the time and you, you have to go and look for what's new, what's fresh, what's changing because the, the world is changing out there all the time, isn't it? And you have to be really at the sharp end, I think, uh, as a yeah. training provider. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. We, yeah. we, we, we spend a lot of shiny stuff out there. Yeah, yeah. 
on, on the trade floor, like millions and millions and millions of dollars of, 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 of shiny bits of tools and equipment. But yeah, we'll take out from it. Like I did, I did um, more workshops than I've ever done at a um, at an NADA because everyone knows there's after drinks, there's after dinner, there's networking and all those sort of things. You get to bed at two a.m. and you're up at seven, right? You're living on five hours sleep a day. Yep. Uh, might have a half an hour kip in the afternoon sort of thing. But what, what I found was, and I pushed myself to get make sure we get the most out of it, I took two of my team members with me. The thing that the trainers were talking about who were running workshops, and a lot of these guys had their own businesses and some had their own dealerships, which was fantastic. Mm. It was all about focusing on the things that don't cost you any money. Don't have to go looking for that new widget, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's all the things that don't cost you money. So working on how people feel when they come to your dealership. We did a dealership visit, which is at Southwest Ford in Texas. Mm-hmm. And we, 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 we toured um, the, the US with a group over in Australia called the ADA. Uh, we went on the convention with about another 85 delegates. And when we rocked up to this dealership, two big black coaches, you know, we pull up in the driveway, right? And then we walk up to the showroom and we're going in the showroom because they had everything set up in the showroom and we're doing a dealership tour. And there was a guy at the front door. He shook everybody's hand as you as you walked in the door. The whole Not two that. coaches. The whole two coaches. I, it was amazing. I, and, I, and I'm not. I'm not. And behind him was another guy. And behind him was another guy. Yeah. So the experience is pretty cool. And he said, "Hi, I'm Charlie Gilchrist. Welcome to Southwest Ford. Hi, I'm Charlie Gilchrist. Welcome to Southwest." He greeted everyone, and then yeah. we all sat down. And then uh, this guy got up on the podium and said, "Welcome, everyone. I'm Charlie Gilchrist. I am the owner." You love of- it. So he didn't have to do that, right? So the, the message was at NADA was focus on the people, yeah. the things that don't cost you any money. Focus on your staff, the yeah. things, uh, you know, they do cost you an investment each week, but, you know, how well do you know your staff? How often do you check in with them? Um, do you sit down and have a three-month conversation around how do you feel your career is going? You know, are we in line with where you want your career to be going? Yeah. Um, check you know, and keep, keep checking in with those people. Um, meet and greet your customers mm. when they come to the showroom. You know, does everyone remember that in 2019? Yeah. We used to meet and greet people. <laughs> we do that. I uh, guess so. that, that's... It got really hard back then, and people, managers were even double opening, not just double closing. Yeah. So those, yeah, focus on the people was a message mm. and focus on what's your team's why, what makes them tick. Is it money? Is it career progression? Is it being able to sometimes watch their kids' sports? Mm. Is it to drive a, 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 a better car or a bit more flexibility in their day? Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I really got out of that. I thought, wow, you do need all the things behind you, all the tools, but the most valuable resource is people. Mm. And if you are not focusing on people, it doesn't matter what you buy out there. It, mm. it, it's it's, it's going to be short-lived. I, I'm just going to say, anyone listening to this podcast – who uh, has not done the NADA trip? Um, Patrick Tessier, uh, James Vortman from the AADA, the Australian Automotive Dealers Association. They do such a great trip every year out there. And uh, I just tell any dealer out there listening to this, um, get, get out there and have a look at what's happening there because it is it is just uh, such an eye opener sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. The great thing about those guys, it's, you know, there's you know, the, the tour series, but they don't take themselves serious. Yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of fun, you know. Like, you know, it just I remember one night we we're doing a Q and A there, and they had some, you know, some foreigners from other countries, and we we're talking about Australian uh, lingo sort of thing. And, and, just, <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure if you were there that night, Simon. I was there that night with asking people, "What do these things mean?" Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what do you think a thong is? You know? <laughs> yes, exactly. And they go, what you know is it underwear? But we know thongs of you know what we put on our feet. So it was all that sort of thing. But the guys are just like, yeah. We have a lot of fun, which makes it great, especially when it's long days and long nights. That just leads me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.